Welcome to the CEO Luncheon. I am Carla Martinez, General Manager of the Chamber of Commerce Canada Peru, organization in charge of promoting Peru's participation in the PDAC. I would like to thank the institutions that made possible the organization of the CEO Luncheon, the Ministry of Energy and Mines, the Ministry of Foreign Trade and Tourism, INGEMET, and PROM Peru. I would also like to thank our Diamond sponsors, Anglo American, Antamina, Barrick, Cerro Verde, Contacto, Endy, Goldfields, Hadbay, Calpa, MMG Las Bambas, Poderosa, Sierra Metals, Southern Copper, Suma Gold, Epiroc, Nexa Resources, Condomex, E29 Resources, and NLX. Also, I would like to thank our platinum sponsors, Confi Petrol, Incimet, Ferreros, Hatch, Montali, M3 Engineering, Cumbra Engineering and Construction, Newest, MSA Inversiones Peru, Willaya Ventures, Tecnofast, Cluster Minero del Sur del Peru, and Pan American Silver. And in the gold sponsors, thank you, Achilles, Bear Creek, Construcciones Rubau, Coretec, Scotia Bank, Techin, Renasa, SNC Lavalin, and Explamin. Thank you very much. Before leaving the floor to Jorge Leon Benavides, President of the Chamber of Commerce Canada Peru, I would like to present a video produced by the Chamber of Commerce and F45 called Mining Pride. Twenty twenty one will still be challenging for all of us. Reality changed our habits and our way of working, of studying, and of training. We are taking care of ourselves, but at the same time, we are supporting the population of our areas of mining influence while we face the challenge to emerge strengthened. We are not gathered today. Nonetheless, technology allows us to keep together to learn and exchange ideas virtually. Mining is the sector that has recovered the fastest. In six months, it has returned to its pre-pandemic production levels and it contributes 14% of the gross domestic product. In Peru, we can add value in deposits that will allow us to double the mining production in the next coming years. We have great investment opportunities we will recover the growth, the employment, and we will have overcome the pandemic. We are a country that shelters diverse potentialities and also diverse cultures. At the same time, we are open to the world, working and producing with very strict sanitary protocols. Mining in Peru is the number one income generator. It takes care of the environment makes proper use of water resources. We start the wheel of progress, of development and well-being of the country. Fortunately, the world economy is accompanying us, demanding more metals, and in Peru, we have them all, and for everyone to invest and produce. We are waiting for you. We are willing to keep fueling and accelerating the engine of history that gathers us today. The future is you. PDAC 2021. Without further ado, please welcome Jorge Leon Benavides. Thank you so much, Carla, for that introduction. My name is Jorge Leon Benavides, and I am the president of the Canadian Peruvian Chamber of Commerce. I would like to welcome you to the CEO lunch. And it's been a very challenging year. We have put in a lot of efforts for this virtual PDAC. These efforts have been conducted by our general leader, Carla Martinez, as well as the support of the president of the delegation, Jose Tudela. It's been a great effort for us to be able to adapt the event to a virtual format and to create an experience regardless of the challenges. As of that, we also acknowledge many tangible benefits, such as the number of attendees that we are welcoming in this version of the platform. 
In fact, more people are now able to participate and join us for this event as there is no need to travel anymore and we are hosting the event virtually. As of that, we can present Peru as a big opportunity for investors so they can also acknowledge the advantages of investment in the mining sector. Furthermore, I would like to mention that it has also been a challenge to continue being a country sponsor for us. We want to continue being a sponsor and we would like to keep our sponsorship from PDAC. This allows us to experience many benefits that you will be able to discover throughout this important event. I would also like to encourage you that I find really important for you to follow all the different activities that we have prepared for this PDAC 2021. As I mentioned, you will be amazed by this platform and the plethora of interesting activities that we have put together, taking into account a lot of creativity. We have keynote speakers, and I'm sure this will be very helpful and enjoyable for our Peruvian providers and mining companies, especially for foreign and local investors, as there are plenty of national investors in the country. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor and introduce the president of the Central Reserve Bank, Mr. Julio Velarde, who has already joined us throughout this PDAC. Welcome, Mr. Velarde. Thank you, Jorge, for your words. This is the first time that we do the CEO luncheon virtually. Next year, we will be back to the face-to-face -face modality, returning to a wonderful culinary experience involving CEOs, investors, and global analysts to show the competitive advantages of investing in Peru. In the current virtual modality, we will keep the energy and the high quality of the information provided. In this segment, we will have two outstanding speakers, Julio Velarde, president of the Central Reserve Bank of Peru, and Martin Walter, mining hydrocarbon and geothermal engineering expert from the Inter-American Development Bank. Please welcome Julio Velarde. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. For me, it's a pleasure being here with you. And a year ago, when we were first hearing of the pandemic starting in the world, uh, having cases in China and in northern Italy, we met in Toronto. It was an opportunity to share some things with you, and I have repeatedly participated in this event even though this year we're having a virtual format. Thank you for the welcoming remarks, and I would like to talk to you about the current economic situation. And we will talk about the most important fundamentals of the economy. We have had one of the most dramatic falls in April, especially in the second quarter of 2020. This was due to a really restrictive lockdown that we had. I think that only India had some restrictive measures that were similar to Peru. So we had this big fall in the economy in comparison to many different developing countries. For example, the social assistance is weak, we have more people living together in developing countries, and it's harder for us to take social distancing measures, etc., etc. And as you can see, in comparison to other countries from the region, we had this really dramatic fall. However, our recovery has been really fast. If we see the figures of the results of 2020 versus such in 2019, we are showing a better performance as a country. 
in comparison to the six different countries in the region. Only Brazil is showing a higher growth in December 2020 against December 2019. Some other countries like Argentina, Mexico, Chile, and Colombia show a higher economic recession against the growth that we are experiencing in December of 0.5% growth. And this is not only applicable for Latin America. If we see the five biggest economies in Europe, we can see the results in the fourth quarter, while in Peru, we have a fall in the second in the second quarter, we have had some falls in Germany, Italy, France, Spain, and UK are higher. In Germany, they had a fall of 3.9%, and Spain also had a fall of 9.1% for, for the fourth quarter. And here we can also see some other countries that have their information as well, and our recovery has been quick and really extraordinary. It has had to do with the activities related to macroeconomic measures that the authorities have undertaken. We still need to adjust the growth for this year in comparison to the lockdown that we have had in February. It's not, it hasn't been the same and it hasn't been as restricted as the previous lockdown that we had in 2020. So we hope that for the next year, we will be able to keep on growing, being Peru a developing country. Even if we compare ourselves, here I have the data up to 2019, we can see that Peru's growth is doubled in comparison to other countries in Latin America including some of the best players, like Colombia and Chile. This has been generated in a low inflation framework. In Latin America, we have only had two countries that have a really low inflation, like Peru. One is not included in the chart, it's El Salvador, and the other one is Panama. These, have, uh, these countries have an inflation of around 2%. Two, two then we can see Ecuador's situation for the century, which has been basically doubled in comparison to Peru's. And we have also had we have also had this low inflation because of prudent fiscal policies, and even we had an important growth of the fiscal deficit in 2020, of course, the different expenditures that were undertaken because of um, transfers to families and health costs. We see that this 0.4 deficit became an 8.9. So we just expect to have a 4.4 deficit for 2021. This is thanks to the consensus of investment banks and its projections and forecastings. Only Mexico has a lower deficit. It's important to mention that this estimate we have had in January the tax revenue in Peru against the different figures of the pre-pandemic context. And that means that the domestic fiscal revenue, as you may know, are impacted by the copper price as well as the recovery of some other minerals. It is important to mention and to remember that when we have fiscal revenues that were high a decade ago, the copper price 
were half of what we have now. The copper price that we have as of today is the highest one that we have ever had in history. And we hope these prices to keep on getting higher so the fiscal deficit can get better. And now we, has con we have consumption tax and the tax and the tax revenue as well, that we have an important recovery. The debt of 2019, we see that Peru, Peru escalated this percentage up to 35%, and we hope it to, to be more balanced this year because the GDP will recover. And among the six greatest economies, we are hoping to have a better debt and a lower debt among these countries. Brazil, for example, has a higher debt than its GDP. And it's they are hoping for a better recovery this year. The same for Argentina. They are hoping their debt to be greater than their product. And some other countries are pretty close to its product. So the yield of the sovereign bonds taking into account international markets and international rates have decreased their interest rates that we have applied in Peru in the nation, national currency. We can see here the bond up to 10 years that is lower than 4%. It is true that it has gone up against the levels that we used to have at the end of last year. But this has been because the yield of the American treasure bonds have been highly corrected in these last weeks. And if this if and if the yield of these bonds go up to avoid the fear of having a, a larger inflation, then we will have consequences in many countries. That's what has happened. And regardless of this political instability that we have been having for several years, as we can see in this chart, regarding the yield of Peruvian sovereign bonds, we can see that these have been lower except from Brazil because of the removal and the appointment of the president of Petrobras who didn't create trust in the markets. This has generated that in Brazil, that Brazil hasn't produced the same reduction rates that we have applied in Peru. But let's see what happened in November. We have had a reduction of rates that has been higher than many countries. We still see the bonds that are paying less behind Chile. Both Chile and Peru, we are countries that can create debt in our local currencies. So this trust, this trust in the bonds, in the currency, in the economic management is translated in basically in the bonds that will be in solis. And in foreign pension funds, I would say that the 52% are sovereign bonds. It's true that our participation has been decreasing for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. We are still one of the highest percentage in the developing countries framework. We have been developing this trust for foreign pension funds with our macroeconomic policies in order for us to be, in order for them to be liable and responsible. International reserves are still pretty high because of the product. 
that is one of, of the highest ones in the emerging markets. Even in December of 2019, before the pandemic hit, our international reserves have grown almost $10 billion. Not only that, by implementing an expansive monetary policy, we have also reduced the interest rates, one of the lowest rates in emerging markets, to a figure of 0 0.25 compared to developing countries. The central bank created a credit line for the monetary fund that was created in 2008 and 2009 crisis. And this does not require conditionality. This credit line is only for those countries who ha that have strong responsible macroeconomic policies. It doesn't require any conditions. As of now, we have asked for $6 billion, but we are still having a lot of credit to ask for, up to maybe an access of other $20 billion. So the current account, thanks to the different exports improvements that we have been having and the import contraction from last year, we have seen that these have been positive. They have dropped at 0 0.5 against the average that we used to have of minus 2%. We are hoping for it to remain positive this year. Thanks to the consensus of the investment banks, we have a positive figure of 0 0.1, but I think that this will be higher because of the factors that I just mentioned, the high recovery and the quick recovery of, in metal prices. And we can see this in the trade balance. And in 2020, we already had a surplus when it comes to the trade balance. And it was higher than those from the last decade. In this year, we have our official forecast from three months ago of uh, 13.253 billion for next year. Now, taking into account the metal prices that we are having and this surplus, and having this former forecast, that was already the highest surplus that we have had ever in our history and in previous years, let's say in 2012. Now, we are confident that this number will go higher to extraordinary levels. We are trying to get to an 8% or 9% increase in the GDP. As you can see here, we have had an impressive recovery. We had a 40% fall in April of 39.2%, and we have been recovering our economy in the last quarter. In October, we only had a fall of 3.8, 3 of November 2.8, and in December, we grew 0.5%. The forecasts for January also reflect a positive picture, but we will see what will happen after this lockdown. However, we think that this lockdown is being more flexible in comparison to last year's. We need to still collect more data. In this financial framework, we were expecting this lockdown to have really important damages and a higher drop of the product. But this hasn't happened because of the support, the credit support that was granted to companies once that the lockdown became even more flexible. That really helped the economic activity to be recovered quickly 
in the third quarter. We see that this decrease has been lower in comparison to other countries in the region except from Brazil. And it's also lower than those of the top five European economies. So what are the forecasts for this year and the next one? In 2020, we had a fall in the second quarter of 11.5%, but we see this really strong fall that we had in this framework. And then, yes, Argentina has apparently fell less than before, but still has an important figure. And for next year, it is forecast that Peru will have the strongest recovery of the region of 11.5. We really need to take a better look of the data that we will gather up to the end of March. So other similar measures have been undertaken by the main international institutions and by the main investment banks. The forecast for 2022 is to keep growing and to be and to have the highest growth in the region. So this recovery has also been reflected in the formal employment which had dropped almost nine almost nine percent in March. In December, the number changed to two point seven. It is true that in the private sector has suffered more from the pandemic as we as we see in this chart. We had a fall of 12.1% in May, and in December, we still have a figure of 5.8%. We still think that the formal job levels that were attained before the pandemic will be recovered by the first quarter of 2022. This will be before, this will be after the recovery of the GDP. It is important to mention that another important sector that has contributed to this recovery of the economy has been modern agriculture. We can see that the employment rates are getting higher at a 9%, and they have really been an important asset for the country to create more formal jobs. As we can see in the last indicators, we're having a really important recovery. Here we can see the cement demand. And since October, we have seen a two-digit two figures. And this important figures in this construction sector is showing, is showing that the levels have already been balanced and they have overpassed such 20 19 levels before the pandemic. This recovery in this construction sector has made that the private investment has had a really important growth in this in this fourth in this fourth quarter. We see that the public investment has grown an 8.6% and the non-mining non private investment has grown in 18.7%, as you can see on the chart. Then we had a drop of 177 and for the non-mining private investment, a drop of 153 However, we are remaining positive. For mining investment, we expect that this year we will recover 2020 levels we are expecting a $5.5 billion in mining investment compared to the $4.3 billion that we had in the previous year. And we hope that in 2022, 
will achieve the $6 billion mark. Of course, these figures may change according to the different conditions in the government, in the mining prices, etc. A really important topic that I would like to address is that we are having a larger consumption capacity going on, especially in the people who have kept their jobs. We have seen some other companies regarding investments as well. And we see that in the four, in the in one of the quarters of last year, we see the private savings from last year of 26.1%, which has been the highest number in the last three decades. And here we can see what happened in what will happen in the fourth quarter or in the fourth semester of 2021. And we expect a 30.3% growth. Then when we talk about some other levels before the pandemic, we will be talking about a 20% maybe. When we talk about the formal total payroll, it has grown in 1.8%. As in many countries, this private, in, this private savings are being shown. But for this, we need to achieve a successful vaccination so that people will be more confident in the economy and when that when that moment will arrive we will have a really important rebound especially in purchases that have to do with this part of the economy and then we have the vaccine doses here that i think are really important and these are from the official estimates that we have collected we expect them to be quicker or faster. We are expecting them to arrive at the end of April of about 7.6 million doses. And what supposedly the government has mentioned, we will get up to 77.2 million doses by the end of the year. Here we can see which have been the vaccines that were confirmed in these last month. And in April, we are expecting, as I mentioned, 7.6 million doses. We are expecting to have the population older than 16 years old to be vaccinated soon. We're talking about 24.8 million people. We expect at least 60% of that population to be vaccinated by the end of July. But having a more realistic perspective, we may be close to a 50%. And this will definitely help this economic recovery that we that we are looking for. When we see the fall of the employment, we see so many sectors that have to do with the human contact, such as restaurants, hotels, transportation and storage. Regarding restaurants and hotels, they are translated into a 50%. If we see the GDP for restaurants and hotels, we have had a fall of 50%. We're talking about an important part of the workforce, and these sectors will recover only when people will be more confident to have this contact with different people. When we talk about monetary policies, as soon as the lockdown was declared, we decided to lower down the interest rates. And in Easter, we decreased these rates up to 0.25%, one of the lowest ones in the region. 
We had the case of Poland at 0.10% and Czech, and Czech Republic at 0.25% as well. Still, this is a really low interest rate in comparison to United States that it's about zero, between zero and 0.25%. The difference with the states is that we are a developing country. And we have injected liquidity at 9.2% of the product. And in the 2008 and 2009 crisis, as you can see, we had a really important expansion at that time, but it cannot be compared to what's going on now. And we have had that injection through the banks. We have performed differently in comparison to other countries like the US or Europe, where the banking market is still reluctant. And this market is one of the most important ones. We have seen them to be reluctant to offer loans because of this uncertainty of when was the lockdown going to end. And that, lead, and that led to a program of government guarantees. Then this credit granting became an auction in which banks decided to set up interest rates that their clients were willing to pay. Then we recovered a 9% of the product. And then it was almost a 9% of the product for those lower rates than 2%, for those extraordinary interest rates for the companies. Because this was, this was not a cost for the bank, but it was a figure that we ask them. It was a three-year loan uh, with a year of grace period, and we're still working on that so we can have a recovery of debt for these different sectors. This credit expansion in really bad times have been one of the biggest ones with a country that has a one-digit inflation. Only Brazil had a similar growth regarding their companies and here we can see some other countries like Chile, Colombia, Europe, that have lower rates. And ideally, this has been a really important factor for us to recover really quickly. But this credit has been in solace. We have, de we have decreased the credit in dollars. And we're not only talking about company credits, we have had a really important growth, as we can see on the screen. And talking about similar growth rates, we really need to see what we were doing at times where we were growing at 6%. And here we have created a forecast of medium companies, and we are comparing the company credit of 2019 and 2020. We, had a zero, we used to have a 0.5% growth, and last year we had a 51% growth. This has been a loan granted to 500,000 companies that have more than that have less than 3,000 employees so we have had a better liquidity better interest rates and this expansive policy has made inflation to remain low we are expecting a 2% inflation for this year we're expecting a 1.5% and for next year we're expecting a 1.7% so now the central mark, the central bank is expecting to have different figures for March. And then 
I will be summing up because our situation has been really severe, but luckily the recovery has been really strong, stronger than we thought, honestly. And just to sum up a little bit with the answer that with an answer that many banks sometimes look for. The central bank and the Ministry of Economy were both really worried about what was going on with the economy. However, as of now, this concern is basically gone. That means that this recovery has surprised us, even to those experts who participate in what it comes to economic policies. With this, I would like to thank the Peru, the Canada-Peru Chamber of Commerce for this invitation. It has been great to participate in this event. I have been a participant for more than 10 years. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Velarde, for your excellent presentation. The Inter-American Development Bank, or IDB, is the main multilateral financing agent in the country and a first-line partner in Peru's development. IDB's strategy in Peru aims at closing the social and economic gaps between urban and rural areas. It also aims at increasing economic productivity as a foundation for inclusive and sustainable growth. IDB prioritizes the following areas in this strategy, inclusion, water, sanitation, water resources and solid waste, energy, transportation, public management and innovation, among others. Please welcome Martin Walter, mining geothermal and hydrocarbon specialist of IDB, who will present perspectives of Peru and international vision. I would like to begin by saying thank you for the invitation to the Canada-Peru Commerce Chamber. I would also like to acknowledge support from our counterparts in the Ministry of Energy and Mines, the Sociedad Nacional de Minería, Petróleo y Energía, our civil society, civil society partners, and especially our long-standing friends from the government of Canada and global affairs. As you know, I am a sector specialist at, at the IDB. I am based in Santiago de Chile and oversee operations in Peru, Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia. I have been with the bank for approximately eight years and I have had the pleasure of working with our counterparts in Peru since 2016. I will share some of my views about mining in Peru from an international perspective. To this end, I will briefly introduce the IDB and our work in the sector in Latin America and Peru. I will then address four key outstanding issues for the sector and conclude with some thoughts on challenges and opportunities in the next few years. The main takeaway from this presentation is this. The world is changing rapidly. And unless we make use of all tools available to us, we'll continue to miss on major opportunities to reduce socioeconomic gaps in Latin America and the Caribbean. Mining is a pillar of the economy at the regional level and in Peru. And will, come, and will become increasingly important to achieve national and global sustainable development goals. It is possible through better, stronger coordination to pull together and achieve our common objective, to have better conditions to invest and make profits, but also, and most importantly, to combat inequality, foster economic opportunity, and protect the environment. At the IDB, we work to improve the quality of life of Latin America and the Caribbean. Our interest is to improve health, education, and infrastructure through financial and technical support to countries in their efforts to reduce poverty and inequality. Our goal is to promote development in a sustainable and environmentally friendly way. We are the main source of financing for development in the region. We offer loans and technical assistance to our clients with the firm commitment to the achievement of measurable results and the higher standards of integrity, transparency, and accountability. The bank's current priority themes include three development challenges, social inclusion and equality, productivity and innovation, and economic integration, and three cross-cutting themes, gender equality and diversity, climate change and environmental sustainability, and institutional capacity and the rule of law. 
The bank, due to its regional presence, reputation, capacity to mobilize resources and sector knowledge, has unique attributes with respect to other actors, including other IFIs, to support our region to improve its capacity to optimize the benefits derived from the mining sector, mitigate its negative impacts, and enhance its positive impacts in the value chain. We know that mining plays a critical role in economic development for our region. The sector is a driver of local economic activity, generates resources for public spending and investment. It is a driver of infrastructure investment and profound territorial transformation. It can pave the way for institutional development, institute innovative financing mechanisms and regulatory development. There is an opportunity here that we all know to habilitate and mobilize a project portfolio of up to $56 billion. And the IDB can also foster well-paid jobs directly and indirectly. Between four and six indirect jobs are created for every direct job in the mining sector in Peru, with the potential to double the contribution of the providers in the value chain and, and their contribution to the national GDP. As we know, mining has been critical to economic development in Peru and in the region. It is also a key to our future, for it is producing the critical inputs we need to meet our shared climate goals. Without copper, zinc, lithium, and other minerals available in the region, it will be very difficult to curb global greenhouse emissions, transform our energy matrix, and phase away from fossil fuels to renewable energy at an adequate scale. Recognizing the cross-cutting nature of mining impacts and its important role in sustainable development. We support our beneficiary countries based on the international best practices in the management of the sector and our lessons learned in our time working in the region along three basic pillars. We work to foster enabling conditions for investment. This is improving territorial competitiveness through infrastructure development, enhancing economic linkages and strategic planning uh, efforts. We support the transition to low carbon economies and implementation of better conditions to improve sector sustainability, including risk management of stranded assets. These are the resources that for environmental and economic reasons, we may not develop. And the identification of new opportunities to decarbonize and decontaminate the sector more effectively. We help strengthen the design and implementation of institutional frameworks and arrangements, encompassing laws, regulations, and the architecture of sector governance including through promotion the development of fiscal regimes that make it possible to better manage the volatility of public revenue and increase the progressiveness of fiscal instruments and accelerate much needed public investments with transparency and accountability across the board. On these fronts, the bank has been supporting the government of Peru, mainly mobilizing non-reimbursable technical cooperation resources with significant support from the government of Canada. Let me share with you some recent examples to flesh this out. We have been an honest broker to support the generation of a common vision for sector development by engaging diverse stakeholders on the challenges and opportunities related to investment in mining in Peru. To do this, we have been supporting the vision of mining 2030 and the establishment of the Remai Center for Convergence of Good practices in the mining and energy sector. This is an innovative platform for public-private dialogue on key topics, including water, innovation, and territorial development. At a different scale, we support the participatory making of national pilot mining policy. We've done this, for example, in Chile, where we are also including support for the indigenous consultation process. These instruments are the basis for state policy, Politica de Estado, uh, which are helpful in creating shared views consensus, but also creating additional certainty and predictability for state policy in the sector. In addition, we support the dissemination of best practice and strengthening of sector governance through generation of knowledge and supporting the improvement of institutions and tools. For example, we supported MINEM in the establishment of the National Directorate for Mining Promotion and, Sustain and Sustainability and the modernization of statistical information systems and transparency initiatives. We work together with academic institutions in the analysis of district level impacts of mining investment on inequality and economic development. We have learned, for example, 
the mining impact can be much more effective in reducing social gaps when it is joined and conjoined by public investment. Also, I invite you to visit the website of the Mapa Inversiones Peru País Mineros platform, which was recently launched. It is an information integration platform to make transparent the impact of the mining sector contribution in public investment flows. This is about closing the loop between mining production and public investment in the territory. We have also co-led with the public and private sector the implementation of the emerging women leaders in the mining sector flow, this is, which is in its second edition, which aims to reduce gender gaps in the sector. Much more is needed in this field to fully benefit from a diversity of perspectives and capacity from the local workforce. We also work on innovation in the development of SMEs and value chains, paying attention to the need to strengthen production chains and increase the impact and resilience of mining related enterprises. We have supported the development of a technology roadmap for mining suppliers and the strengthening of initiatives to add value to the supply chain in the areas of influence of mining projects and operations, among other activities. We are supporting the promotion of labor force or workforce development in, in an area of influence of a large project in the southern part of Peru that we are very proud of and which will soon hope to be announcing a second phase. This is in Queyabeco. Let me share with you some final thoughts and perhaps I'm going to extend myself a little bit. Without a doubt, Peru has been one of the most economically and socially successful cases in the region. The Peruvian economy has radically transformed in the last quarter of a century, going from the instability and economic deterioration of the 80s to being, to date, one of the most prosperous and fastest growing economies in the region. After expanding at an average rate of over 5% since 2000, Peru remain, remains, despite the recent slowdown, as one of the economies with the best prospects in the entire region. Thanks to these results, Peru has become an upper middle income country with a GDP per capita of six more, or of over almost $7,000 uh, per capita in, 20, in 2019. The region, and particularly Peru, was favored by international context of mineral prices in the first decade of this century. In that period, raw material prices increased on average 140%. For metals, the figure was 261%. The contribution of the mining sector to the GDP remains around 10% in recent years, 8.7 in 2019, 2020. Mining exports average 60% of the national total and 17 and over approximately 15, 17% of the total public income comes from the sector. The country is a regional leader in mineral production and has enormous additional investment potential in the sector, approximately 55 to $60 billion in the, in the projected pipeline. It is, at the same time, a sector marked by social conflict and volatile political and economic conditions that affect its development. Undoubtedly, COVID-19 has hit a new blow to the sector. 2020 was rough. INE data indicated a 3.4 contraction in GDP in the first quarter of 2020. Due to, due to the pandemic, a trade balance deficit was recorded in April after 17 months of consecutive surpluses. Mining has had to reduce and even stop some of its critical processes. Along with the challenge that the situation presents us, we must recognize that Peruvian mining is too ill-used to surprises. Uncertainty regarding potential conflicts with communities and changes in governance are normal. They are not extraordinary. The successes and failures of Peruvian mining in recent decade, decades should inform us and help us reflect on what comes next. In our study conducted with the Universidad del Pacifico, we, that will soon be published, we found that mining activities contribute, positive, positive, contribute to different dimensions of territorial development positively, but only when it is combined with adequate ad access to infrastructure services. This is investment that comes from the public sector most, most often. In other words, investment in mining, which is not accompanied by investments in health, education, connectivity, and water, among other areas, does not generate sufficient shared value for citizens. And this is where problems lie. 
this, these results indicate the need for joint work between the state, companies, and civil society to continue building a competitive and sustainable sector. The state must better execute the resources generated by the sector and promote investments in an integrated manner. Businesses should support these efforts to obtain and retain their social licenses to operate and build, and build greater trust with citizens. Transparency, good practices, and the genuine and fluid relations of the parties must be accompanied by tangible results. Territorial development and reduction of socioeconomic uh, gaps would generate genuine opportunities for social development. I want to close. In the current critical context, all productive sectors are important for the reactivation. In particular, mining is and will continue to be one of the most important sectors for the generation of fiscal resources, for an exchange and the monetization of the economic activity at both the national and the local level. To better capitalize on its potential to promote development, we must continue to work together. Public-private coordination mechanisms will be essential to facilitate the economic reactivation process. Canada, Colombia, and Chile, for example, have implemented innovative measures to give special follow-up to high-impact strategic projects, which could be an interesting idea for, for Peru. It is necessary to optimize management to reduce conflict, activate the portfolio of public and private investments, and improve the socio-environmental and economic performance of the sector. In addition to promoting innovation in, and new production chains, it is essential to continue strengthening collaboration in sector governance schemes. This is key because these instruments will last over time and generate tangible results for society. A recent critical analysis of the concept of social license to operate, which I found very interesting by Marit Meesters, notes that the idea tends to implicitly foreground economic, governmental, and corporate interests over empowering local stakeholders and other non-corporate actors. More specifically, they emphasize three limitations in the engagement of local stakeholders. First, that companies tend to limit uh, their engagement with communities who live nearby the operations and especially to vocal and organized groups. Second, that stakeholder engagement is often limited and focused on the purpose of continuing extractive operations without disruption or substantial alterations. There seems to be little space for the questions or adequate mechanisms to channel concerns and proposition of stakeholders often perceived as opposing the activity, which, if taken seriously, may require substantial alteration to industry plans. And third, the scope of the SLO, social license to operate activities, is limited as they focus mostly on local and social impacts, disregarding wider environmental and global considerations. Little, little attention is paid within the SLO process to long-term environmental and climatological impacts during and beyond the lifetime of the industrial activity, despite the intimate connections between environmental impacts and social acceptance. In short, the concept falls short when it comes to address systemic issues known by all. This is why we accord so much importance to the efforts made by the Commission for Sustainable Mining, uh, the Comisión Barrantes, and its recommendations that identify the need for a national mining policy. Its conclusions are aligned with some of the conclusions of the work done in the Mining Vision 20, 2030 and the establishment of the RIMAI Center for Convergence of Good Practices. Long-term policy instrument can provide greater certainty on the organizing the principles of management and governance of the sector and clarify some doubts and critical issues, such as land use planning and citizen participation. This needs to be done to help us move beyond firefighting to strategic sector management. Of course, it is equally important to solve the bottlenecks that result in underspending and under execution of public uh, investment. The government has adopted numerous regulations in the last quarter of the year to streamline projects and unlock public works. Regulatory and institutional initiatives must be accompanied with sufficient and adequate capacity building efforts for transparent and effective management of royalty, canon, and other resources from the sector. Technological innovation has a lot to contribute to these efforts. From the IDB, we will continue to support these efforts to improve sustainability of the public and private investments in the sector, promote good practice, and open genuine and representative dialogue between the parties interested. 
We put all our knowledge and resources at your disposal. Finally, the COVID-19 crisis is having enormous socioeconomic consequences for Peru, but it is also opening a window of opportunity that should not be missed. I will not continue delving into the many pending challenges of the sector, well known to most of you, but I wanna leave you with a message. It is possible for the mining sector to fulfill its potential promise if it finally recognizes that promoting sustainability is good business and that the proper integration of all interested voices in decision-making can help good development of projects and to improve sector competitiveness.